So this is titled Throwing Up Numbers, and it's kind of a working title, as, I, as, as Nick would know from the last talk. I don't know if I've really settled on whether or not I like that one, but it is what it is. I am uh, I'm Rob Hareska. I'm a software de developer at Huddle down in Lincoln. And uh, I, will make, I will work on making uh, the slides and the resources for this uh, available up on the GitHub repository that uh, it will be linked, linked to here throughout the slides. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if, if they're short, I, I'm, I'm happy to field them uh, in the middle of the presentation. But if it's kind of a long, uh, overarching question, uh, I'd prefer to kind of field those at the end. So if something's not clear, feel free to just kind of chime in and, and ask about it. So this is going to be about dashboards. Uh, and that's dashboards being displays that present information that help you understand things about your application. Uh, they help you understand things like user behavior, user trends, error analytics, those sorts of things. And they're things like Chartbeat. And Chartbeat uh, is really good at giving you your current daily user counts, uh, kind of tells you what most of your users are doing, tells you where your users are being referred from, has really good social integration. It's things like Google Analytics. Uh, and Google Analytics gives you good historic trends. Tells you, again, where your people, uh, your visitors are coming from. Tells you page views, time on pages, what paths they're taking through your website. It might be your standard everyday vehicle dashboard. Uh, might tell you mileage, how fast you're going. In this case, when you're going. <laughs> but this isn't about those kind of dashboards. This is about nuggets. Those are nuggets. But it's not about those nuggets. It's about these nuggets. And this nugget uh, is just a, this is the number of current users on, on our website. This is just a snapshot. But in real life, uh, this number moves up and down in real time uh, pretty, pretty rapidly at times. Uh, and it's kind of cool to watch. And this is just one, you know, one big number with some subtext. Uh, but it's, it's called a nugget because it's, it's just that. It's a small chunk. It's a nugget of information. It's not, it's not like the rest of those dashboards, which were you know, kind of strewn with all these bits of information. Uh, it's just this one little thing. And though it might not look at here, uh, I'd go so far as to say that nuggets are awesome. Uh, but I might be a little bit biased. So hopefully I can intrigue you enough here today uh, with what I'm about to present that uh, I, I, I can hopefully intrigue you enough to actually try and implement one of these, uh, one, of, one of these for yourself. And maybe put it up at your company, put it up somewhere and, and See how they look. So what would you do with, with one of those nuggets? Uh, like with other dashboards, you might put it up on a monitor or a TV, any sort of screen, preferably one uh, up in a public place. They're even fun just to throw on a workstation next to your computer if you've got you know, a spare computer and monitor, something like that. But for the adventurous, you'd put them on a floor. And this is why I think they're awesome. You don't really see these every day. Uh, and I, I'll spend a little bit of time kind of at the end going over the, the floor and, and wall implementation. But first, uh, I'll go through a little bit of background. So according to a guy named Martin Fowler, these would probably be called communal dashboards uh, or information radiators, uh, like the Nebraska.js site kind of titled this. And he's got a blog article with that title. And I've taken a few excerpts here that I think are relevant, and I'll, I'll read them off. First one is, with the growing interest in data analytics and visualizations, we're seeing more effort put into interesting visualizations that allow people to draw insight from data floating around in an organization. Most of these dashboards are aimed at individual usage, but there's a growing tendency to use them for a more communal purpose. They create an emotional engagement with how the business is running, and they're a form of information radiator. And in the article was a picture. It was this, and, and this is apparently from Redbox. Apparently, Redbox projects the, the number of current daily rental counts uh, on the floor somewhere in their office. And when I saw this, I, I, I saw it. I thought it was neat. I didn't really do anything with it at the time. Uh, but ultimately, it ended up being the inspiration for, for this project we're about to see today. Back in the article was another quote. And I think this one, this one to me is the most relevant. It's, this is less about helping people make decisions, more about educating people about what's happening providing background information and context for their, for their regular work. And these dashboards are different than traditional dashboards. If you look back at Chartbeat and Google Analytics, they were all about decision making, right? They're about user patterns, understanding what your users are doing. There's lots of graphs and charts. 
you're usually using them for a specific feature uh, or, or a specific project or a specific team. But the nuggets aren't about making decisions. They're, they're probably not even directly specific to something that you're working on. They're, a reminder about, they're, just, they're just a reminder. They're, they're a reminder about what's happening right now. They give you that background information. And, and that's why I think they're pretty powerful, uh, because they, they do serve as that constant reminder for, uh, for things that aren't really relevant to, to what you might be working on. So on today's menu, uh, that's my little pun on nuggets uh, with menu there, get it? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go over the project structure. Uh, we'll talk code structure and architecture. We'll go through some examples of the nuggets that I've created. And, and then at the end, I'll circle back around and, and spend a little time going over how you can actually realize that, uh, that goal of putting it on, on a floor or a wall or something like that. So let's talk a little bit about the high-level architecture of the project. Uh, it's just a simple client-server architecture. And there were other ways of doing this, but for, for, it's really easy to, to, you know, to develop up front. Client server is a fairly known paradigm. And it's easy to ship bits out to clients without, without having to um, you know, ship new binaries or anything. And in this project, uh, I guess I only had an evening to, evening to prototype the original one out uh, for this, so uh, it kind of came naturally. And in practice, with, with the, the Nugget system here, the client, uh, the server and client are usually on different machines. And this, this will kind of make sense in here in a little bit as, as we go into some of the code. And so at the heart of the node server is a socket IO server. And, and that when, when browsers connect, uh, they, they connect as a socket IO client and, uh, and send messages back and forth between that connection. And the message, uh, to give an example with, with that number we saw earlier with the current users, a message there might just be like the number of current users on the site at a given time, you know, at, at this moment right now. And I'll come back to this, this later here and add a few more pieces and we'll kind of build on this. But first I'm going to spend a few, a few slides just for, for those who aren't really familiar with them about Node and Socket so we kind of have some context for the, the actual project and architecture here. So let's talk about Node. Node is an event-driven server-side JavaScript uh, platform. And it's, it's been around for a few years now. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how long, five, six years, something like that. And there was a lot of initial excitement around it. You know, everybody's like, oh, man, it's, it's JavaScript on the server. It's everything I've always wanted. Uh, and that, that excitement has kind of faded. And now it's, you know, it's, it's pretty stable. It's good. Companies are using it in production environments. It's just a, another good tool in the toolbox. And if you consider what um, if you consider a, a more traditional multi-threaded application, uh, you know something you might see running on a on a JVM somewhere. What you'd normally have there is, is a bunch of threads, uh, and some of those threads are doing computation, computations. Others might be like blocking while they make a network call. But execution of like the code that you have, the code that you wrote, that can that can always continue as long as you've got free threads to work on, right? So if you start up with 50 threads, you can essentially do 50 things at once. But uh, and the code that you, you've written can, can execute on all those 50 threads as long as you aren't, like all 50 of them aren't blocking on network calls to a database or something like that. But a node's core is an event loop. And the event loop is just a single threaded message processor. It's not like that multi-threaded environment. And it's executing your code, and it's doing it just one at a time, and it's doing it real fast. And the key there uh, is that it's only executing your code. Uh, it's not blocking on I.O., and I'll talk about that here in a second. Node does this. Uh, it does this by encouraging a kind of an asynchronous coding style uh, that a lot of people who write JavaScript are familiar with. Uh, it's heavily driven by callbacks that, that work around I.O. calls. And, and these callbacks, when, when they're ready to be executed, they just they get dropped onto the, what, what's essentially a queue, this event loop. Uh, and then they just get processed as they reach the front of the queue by, by the, uh, by the, or on the event loop. And the reason that Node does this is because uh, one of its primary presumptions is that I.O. is really expensive. You spend a lot of time waiting for I.O. to complete, and that takes away from the time that Node could be working on your code, your CPU-bound code. Database calls over the network are slow. You know, we, we usually make a lot of database calls. Uh, calls to remote APIs are slow. Hard drives are slow. Uh, all, all these things are slow, and, and Node's premise is that you really shouldn't be waiting for them to complete, right? If you've got other things to do, why not, why not do them while you wait? And Node takes all those, those blocking operations, and it, and it kind of pushes them aside and takes, takes them outside of the event loop and does them in its own little like hidden threaded environment 
So the, the event loop, uh, it assumes that the event loop is only really ever operating on your code, the code you wrote, and not waiting for a network call to complete. And if that assumption is broken, and the event loop is working on a function that does block, your programs, it's not going to process anything else, right? If you write an infinite while loop, it's going to sit there and it's going to grind on that forever until, until you stop the server. You know, you don't have any more threads to pick up, uh, pick up the activity. And, and that, that model, it might not actually be too unfamiliar to you because JavaScript in the browser works the exact same way, right? If you've ever coded an infinite while loop in the browser, nothing else happens, right? You don't have other threads to, to work out of there. And so this is, this is an example, um, kind, of, kind of a typical coding style. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than, than a lot of the kind of callback-driven style you'd see in Node. Uh, but this, this is an example of an HTTP request uh, where you need to, that, that performs I.O. And so with an HTTP request, uh, we use uh, Node's built-in HTTP library. We create a request object that takes you know, some options about the connection we're trying to make. And then it actually takes you know, a callback to handle the response object. And so when it gets a response, we bind some handlers to receive events. And you'll notice that this is kind of cumbersome, right? We get a data event, uh, and we get a chunk of data. And we have to sit here, and we have to concatenate this data uh, together to get the actual response payload. And then when we're done, we have to know that we're done, and we have to, uh, maybe we can do something when we're done, when we're done with, the, with the payload. Maybe we write that to disk or something. And you know, it, it is kind of cumbersome, but what that does buy you uh, is it buys you that off, off the main event loop asynchronicity. You know, all that I.O., you're never really waiting for, you know, waiting for that connection to come back that, or, the, or the connection to establish uh, or anything like that. You know, it's, it's only ever going to execute code when it's, when it's ready to do it. And most of Node's built-in modules, HTTP uh, file system, uh, are built this way, and they encourage you to, to use this sort of model. Uh, an, another good example is, uh, is the file system API. And normally what you do is, is you'd, you'd read a file, uh, you'd give it a path, and then you know, once it makes that call to disk and comes back up and has, has some data, it's got the contents of the file, then you can, you can operate on those contents, and you weren't waiting in the, in the meantime. But for whatever reason, Node, uh, Node also gives you the ability to, ability to make it really easy to cave and shortcut. Uh, so in this case, we've got... Uh, a read file sync method the node provides. Uh, and this is the, the bad way of doing it, right? As you're reading this file, you'll, you'll notice it doesn't have a callback. But as you're reading it, um, the event loop is blocking, right? So if, for whatever reason, it takes a really long time to do that, none of the rest of your code is, is executing. And it's really easy to, ca to, to cave and shortcut like this. And in a lot of applications, it probably doesn't really matter. Uh, in an application like the one we're, we're going to see here, uh, it's not doing a whole lot of activity, so I can afford to block here. You just have to be aware that as you're doing this, uh, it is going to block. So you know, if you do take these shortcuts, just be aware that, that there are those consequences and, and be careful. So why, why would you want to use Node? Um, well, probably if your application is I.O. bound. If, you, if your application is CPU bound, Node may not be the best choice. You're not really going. You're not really leveraging its strength of taking that I/O and and putting it off to the side and, and making it asynchronous. But Node still can be useful because uh, it's got a really good uh, a really good asynchronous event-driven model, and, and that's part of why I chose it here. You know, I have a lot of real-time events happening. I don't know when they're going to happen, but I'd like to just wait and react to them as they kind of flow in. Uh, and additionally, it works great as an easy socket I/O server. And to talk a little bit about Socket.io here, for those who aren't familiar with it, Socket.io defines itself as a, a WebSocket-like abstraction over several different transports. And WebSockets are a relatively new idea. They've, they've been around maybe, maybe as long as Node. I'm not entirely sure. And if you think about what it was like to develop you know, a client-side application maybe 10 years ago, you didn't really have bidirectional communication. It was built on top of HTTP. And HTTP is you know, a request-response-driven protocol. And so, any time you needed to get something from the, from the server, you had to make that request. And servers didn't really have the ability to ship data back out without a request coming in first, uh, without using things like polling. Uh, and those are, those are kind of dirty. And so when WebSockets came along, WebSockets were, were simply the, the way to uh, establish bidirectional communication to where a client connects to, to a server over HTTP, which is, uh, establishes 
this, this WebSocket connection, and then it just leaves it open over TCP, and the server can ship bits back out to the clients whenever, whenever it needs them or has them. And what Socket.io gives you, it, it gives you that idea, uh, but it can also fall back uh, if the browser or the client doesn't support that native WebSockets natively, it can fall back to things like polling. And, and you get to keep that nice uh, bi-directional interface without, without having to worry about what's going on under the covers. So here's, a, here's kind of a, a really quick and dirty server client example of uh, what you'd see in, in maybe a typical Socket.io uh, socket connection. You see that um, I, I'm actually building this on an HTTP server. When you do this on, in Node, like you pass it an HTTP server to serve it up on. But what you do is you can bind, uh, bind events. The, ser the server will listen here for a connection event. And then when it gets it, uh, it gets a, a socket object that it can use. And then it can, it can bind more listeners onto that socket. So in this case, if, if the socket receives a custom message uh, named client message, it'll, it'll execute this callback. And so on the client side, uh, if we connect up with, uh, with our server, and then we emit client message down here, and, and the name is, is purely arbitrary. It can be anything you want. And we, we just send it a JavaScript object payload. We'd expect the, the server then to receive that message, handle it, and then in this case, it would, it would log it out. And then on the other side, servers can also emit. You know, this is the other, the other side of the equation that wasn't there in that original request response cycle. Sockets can emit these messages, uh, again, an arbitrary message name with, with an arbitrary message JavaScript object. And since, this, this, since the client has been connected uh, and it's bound itself to, to a handler for those messages, uh, it can then receive those coming back to it. And so that's super convenient in, in this architecture where, again, there's a lot of, um, a lot of like, these little small chunks of data getting passed back up to clients. Um, when, when I don't really want to have to have to pull for that. So socket socket IO, uh, at least in, in Node, also has this concept of excuse me of rooms, and rooms are just a way of, of segmenting your clients, uh, kind of grouping grouping them together under common ideas. And if you think about room uh, as analogous to a chat room room, right, it, it kind of makes sense. A lot of people join a room, and then any messages that that get put into that room, go out to all the clients in it. And so in my case, you know, I, I have a stat, and maybe that stat is current users. And so when a client connects, uh, it might subscribe to a stat. And I just use socket.join here, which puts it into a room that has that stat in the name. And then you also get these, uh, you know, an unsubscribe uh, equivalent here. And then you know, when I want to emit, uh, emit you know, current users to, to everybody who, who is subscribed to it, I simply get everybody who's in that room and I emit it out to everybody. And so it's not really a complex concept. It's fairly simple. But Socket gives you, you know, Socket has it built in, uh, and it's really easy to use. It takes care of things like automatically disconnecting it, and removing them from a room if a, if a client disconnects. And it's fairly convenient. Simple idea, but uh, a very useful thing that Socket provides. So uh, with Node and, and Socket in mind, let's check out how that applies to the architecture and how, how the nuggets here use it. So first off, um, all the code for this is in uh, a repository, github.com slash huddle slash nugget. And if you're interested in working with it, uh, you can just fork that repository, create a branch in it, and, and code away. And if you have changes to it, feel free to submit those upstream, and I'll get them merged into, uh, into the upstream. So since this is a node server, uh, we'll talk about here just a little bit how it runs. Uh, the main entry point here is server.js, and, and that could probably use to get split up a little bit. Uh, and then I've wrapped it in uh, this little bash script, which, uh, which actually starts up a, uh, a server or a, a kind of a utility called forever. And forever is an init script-like utility uh, that, that you can use to wrap, wrap a process. And forever, uh, like its name kind of implies, will keep that process up forever. So Node, actually, uh, it's fairly fond of crashing. Uh, Any time an exception reaches, reaches the event loop uh, and it's unhandled, uh, Node will just kind of fall over on itself. And normally, that's probably OK, right? If, if you're crashing, you probably don't want to continue doing whatever you were doing that caused you to crash. 
Uh, you, you might want to log that and come back and circle around and fix it and then start your application back up. But in this case, uh, I don't really have time to babysit these all day long. Uh, I'll log the exception, I'll come back later. Uh, usually it was probably a problem, a problem with the plugin or something like that. So uh, start.sh will, will open up, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it in forever uh, and treat it as a forever process. And then if it goes down, it'll bring it back up. Uh, and, and it's really, uh, forever is really useful, I guess, is, is kind of the point I'm trying to get across here uh, for, for Node specifically. Anytime you want to keep something running forever. So let's circle back around and talk about, uh, we, we had that diagram before. Let's go back to it and, and we'll add a few things here. And now we're going to actually start getting, to some, getting into some concepts that are specific to uh, the code that drives these nuggets. So up on the clients, uh, and the client is just a browser uh, running, running that socket IO client that's connected to the server. I have a notion of something called a display. And a display, uh, it's just a representation of some data. right? So in that screenshot we saw, uh, with with a number of current users, uh, you know, it's just an HTML page. Uh, it's got some markup. It's got some JavaScript, uh, some CSS, uh, those sorts of things. Very simple, you know, just a web page really. Uh, we also have the notion of a data source, and a data source. This is on the server side. It, it's a module on the server that is responsible for actually going out and collecting data from an API, and, and kind of aggregating it or curating it in a way that it can be transformed into a stat, which then when that set is available, gets pushed up to the clients. And so any, any display here uh, that subscribes to a particular stat by name will then receive those events uh, as they're made available. And then the stat, uh, again, is, is just a single, it's just a chunk of data. It's got a payload uh, that is, is whatever you need it to define. How, th these are mirrored uh, fairly um, I don't know, intuitively in, in the directory structure that within the project. So uh, underneath Nugget server, if you see the repository and you see Nugget server, there's, there's a user directory. And that's where you would extend all these, uh, all these scripts out. So user, you see it has data sources, displays, uh, and then resources. Data sources is where you would build a module that is responsible for going out and collecting that data. So if you've got a remote data source, uh, for the current user's example, in my case, it was Chartbeat. Uh, I have something that goes out and it pulls, uh, pulls that data down from Chartbeat. Uh, and that is just in a file called chartbeat.js for me. And, and so it's one data source per module. Uh, you might have several data sources that then get aggregated by a display. In the displays directory, uh, it's just three simple files, right? You've got a CSS file, a JavaScript file, and an HTML file. And whatever you name them here is how your display is going to be referenced um, uh, it, it, later when I'll, I'll show you in a little bit where, where you'll see that. But it's mostly conventional, right? So. Uh, you just need to have all three in there, and, and that's what you'll what'll be displayed on the page. And then there's also a resources directory. So if you have any uh, jQuery plugins or something, uh, any common libraries that just need to be shared by all the displays, these will be served up statically that you can access uh, access out there. And then uh, on top of that, I've also got a nice little uh, server config JSON file that uh, you can use to you know keep app or API credentials and stuff out of your code. Uh, server config. Uh, objects that you define in there get passed into data sources and, and you can use them uh, within there. So this will all make a lot more sense once we see an example. Uh, and so let, let's start with a, a fairly simple example of, of a, a nugget called current time. And, and this nugget is just going to essentially display what the current system time is uh, on the server. And so in this case, if we, if we take that diagram and we uh, actually apply real, real names to it, on the browser, we've got a current time, a current time display. We've got a system time data source, which is going to grab the, the time from the system. And, uh, and it's going to grab it at one second intervals. And it's going to emit a stat named time. And then the, the browser, the, the client up here, is going to subscribe to time. And when it receives those time events, it's going to react to them and update the page repeatedly. So. The directory structure, again, it's mirrored here. We've got server time as our data source module. And we've got um, current time as our, as our display name. And so this is, this is the code uh, on the data source side. And you'll notice it's fairly short. This is only about uh, 19 lines or something like that. And so this is, this is a node module. Uh, it's just an object that uh, when, when you write a node module, node provides you with this, this notion of a thing called exports, module.exports. And any module you write, you just pass it an object. 
and and anything that then in an object or a function or anything and then another module that wants to include this uh, just gets everything that's that's assigned to exports there. So in this case, we uh, with the nuggets we just need to define a start and a stop function uh, on an object literal that, that gets exported by the module. And so in this case, um, start uh, start is is provided two two properties here. It's a con the config and an emitter, and the config came from that JavaScript file, uh, and the emitter uh, I'll, I'll kind of show you show you here below. So, like I mentioned before, time the time here it's going to it's simulating kind of a pulled data source, right? So if you were doing this with a remote API, the concept would be similar. We're gonna we're gonna uh, set an interval here. Uh, we're gonna every one second execute this callback, and in here we're just going to grab the the system date, uh, do a little bit of string manipulation on it, and we're going to call emitter dot emit stat with uh, with time. Um, Time is a stat name and the object literal that's going to have uh, a value property that has the actual the actual system date. And then up on the client, uh, so this is this is the client, uh, the display module, and this is the require JS module. So so require is going to pull this in, and this needs to this is this is returned down here similar to what we were seeing in, in nodes exports. Uh, it's simply returning an object that defines a couple of uh, a couple of properties. It defines a sources array, and sources is kind of analog analogous to stats in the code. Uh, but this is going to—that's essentially the sources that it's going to subscribe to. So in this case, it's subscribing to time, and then it, it defines a couple of handlers here: an on stat. So whenever it receives a time event, it's going to execute this this on stat method. I'm getting behind on my slide here. It's going to execute this on stat method here, uh, and what we're going to do here: we've got jQuery available, so we're going to find a time. Time object uh, or time element in the browser by ID, and we're simply going to set its text to uh, to the value of that message. And then there's also an initialized method. Uh, so if you need a any time the data source is loaded, if you need to do something that first time uh, and not every time, you can use that. I didn't use it here, but uh, it's just a good a good example of that. And so the other two components of that display were uh, the HTML and the CSS file. And so the HTML is super simple. It's just a, a div, and it's, got, um, it's just got an ID of time. And that's the element that we're actually going and we're putting the, the time in. And then we've got our CSS file, again, really simple. Uh, the div up in the HTML gets just put into a body tag. And uh, so let's see what this looks like. So. Might be a little bit hard to see from the back, but I feel like I'm on this panel here. So this is the current time, and so if you if you kind of think back and, and saw what we were doing there, uh, the the server here is actually running on my laptop. So I've got a, a node server running on the laptop, and every one second that's pulling the system time, grabbing the time, doing date manipulation, and pushing it up on that socket IO connection. Over here, I've got uh, a little Raspberry Pi, which is just another computer, and it's running Chrome. And it's receiving those time events and updating, updating, updating. And so uh, this, is, this is a basic nugget, right? It's, it's not a very glamorous one. Uh, so let's do something else. Let's do current users. So we saw that snapshot of current users. Uh, and that's, that's maybe a little bit more active, uh, a little bit more interesting. So the current users uh, was, was the original uh, this this was the first one I wrote, uh, and, and it was it was it was the one that was inspired by that red box, um, that red box image, and uh, I, I did it in I kind of prototyped it out in the evening, and, and you know the moment I saw it it was it was really awesome. You know the moment it actually worked it was that aha moment. Uh, so uh, I'll kind of walk you through uh, kind of how it was architected. So again with the diagram here, uh, it, it's very similar, right? We just have a current users. Display a current user's uh, data source on the server and a current user's stat. I just named it all uh, the same here, just for the for the sake of easiness. In this case, current users is a little bit more complex. It's actually aggregating data from Chartbeat, which will give us that uh, that real time count. Uh, but Chartbeat only provides me with 
the the current uh, number of users on the on the on the desktop version of the site, uh, visiting it through a browser. So I actually have to bring in another data source, uh, Splunk, which is our logging aggregator, to pull in traffic that's coming from our our mobile apps because uh, that gets logged in there. We don't track it with Chartbeat. So let's see some code from from this one. Uh, you'll see that we've actually we're actually going to make two API calls here. We're going to make one to to Chartbeat. Uh, and so these are just the options we're going to pass into uh, our HTTP request. Uh, we're just giving it essentially a URL and a path. And, and then you'll notice that uh, I've also got a couple of config properties there. You know, I didn't have to include them in the code, so I can, uh, I can keep those out of the source and not you know, commit that into the repository. So it's fairly useful for, for things like that. Then you'll notice that I'm also uh, I'm using a node module for connecting to Splunk up here. Uh, and if we go down to... Uh, what we're what we're going to do uh, again? We're we're going to loop on this one. Uh, it, it's fairly easy just to to loop on these data. If we had a stream of of data, we could we could do that too here. But we're just gonna we're gonna do this one every every ten seconds, I think. And so in this case, we're gonna we're gonna take those take that request. We're just gonna grab some JSON. Uh, we're making an HTTP request there, which is returning JSON that has some user counts in it. And then when we're done with that, we're gonna query Splunk uh, with a with a kind of a, a windowed search. And then we're going to uh, we're going to emit a current user stat, which which the display is, has subscribed to. So not quite as as simple as the um, as the as a current time one, but again, like this is this is not too much code. We're we're only at probably I think 30 lines from top to bottom here. Uh, sends a couple of imports, uh, and I've stripped it down a little bit, but at its whole, it's it's not very complicated. You're really just concerning yourself with with how you get the data and not how you communicate it. So let's take a look at current users. So this is, uh, should be in motion here. I actually had to, uh, I wasn't sure about the network here, so some of these are a little bit, uh, these are simulated. Let me, it's way, it's way cooler when it moves. There we go. <clears throat> So in this case, uh, this is you know this is the real time version of that snapshot uh, we saw at the beginning of the presentation, right? It's uh, 1,800 people on on the site tells us the peak, and then down at the bottom, uh, I took a little bit of extra dashboardiness and and threw down some breakdowns by uh, by what 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 part of the application the the users were coming from or visiting. All right, so polling is cool. Um, you know, pulling pulling is great, but sometimes uh, some services don't really work that way. Uh, GitHub is a great example, and so GitHub repositories are, are capable of firing off a an event called a post receive hook. Anytime something significant happens in the in the repository, and those significant events might be might be a merge, it might be a, a commit, uh, something like that. But the way that it works is when that event 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 occurs, it, it makes an HTTP post request out to some endpoint. And so you need to actually have an endpoint for it to, to send those things to you. And so uh, here's, a, here's how, you, how, how, oh, excuse me, how you configure that in, in GitHub uh, service hooks. Uh, you can just basically specify a URL. And it sends you this, this huge JSON, uh, JavaScript payload uh, that has all kinds of properties and all the commits, uh, anything that happened in that event. Uh, and you kind of got to extract the, the value out of it. And so uh, we'll walk through again the, the data source and the, and the displays on on a, for, the, for this one. This is the data source, and, and this just, I've only defined a start function here. I actually don't need to stop. But you notice that, that I've actually added uh, a third property here. So it's called receiver, and any data source you define within, within the Nugget code automatically creates, uh, gets an inbound route created for it. Uh, and so uh, in this case, your server inbound data source name. So whatever you name your data source, so in this case, it's uh, my server inbound uh, GitHub commits because it goes off the data source name, and so that's all I really put into um, into my GitHub post receive hook. Uh, you might have to route it through a, a port forward on your router or something like that. And then, so when the server receives when it receives a message, uh, you can re receiver is is an event emitter. So whenever whenever it gets one of these messages from GitHub, it emits an inbound event, and I handle that, and it's it's given some J JSON. 
and I, I parse that I parse that out, uh, and then I extract all the all the good GC commit information out of there, and I emit that in a set called commits. And oops, what's going on? So for this one, um, let's see here, yeah. So the way the way that I I guess the reason that I decided to do this one uh, is that the the first the first one I'd written. The, the current users was like, it was kind of global and it was a really good thing that everybody in the company could, uh, could identify with. But I wanted to put one up in our, our product team area, you know, where, where all the development's actually happening. And so I wanted to uh, do something that was a little bit more focused and reflective around development. I felt like, you know, if I could see, well, what I kind of visualize, you know, as we work through the day, you know, we're committing, uh, we're merging stuff into master and those sorts of things. And th those are all fairly significant events. And so I, I kind of visualized this, this wall of bricks that kind of built up out of commits and merges uh, as, the, as the day progressed, and at the end of the day, you had this big stack of bricks, which was the, the product, te product team's work for the day. And so that's kind of how I visualize this. And so ultimately, it ended up looking like, um, like this, which it takes just a second on this one to load, if it will load. All right. That may be a little bit difficult to see in the back there. Um, but you can kind of see the bricks there, and each brick is given an icon. Um, and the icon is representative of the squad that, that actually made the commit. And so the little squares there are, are individual commits uh, into any branch. And then the, the big yellow ones are indicative of merges into master uh, in a given project. Because uh, for us, a merge into master is essentially a deployment into production. They're, they're fairly one to, excuse me, one to one. So, and and the, the block is proportional to the number of commits that were in the merge. And so what, what happens during the day uh, and this one's simulated. I, I would go into GitHub and I would make a commit, and it would appear at the top. And as you're walking by, you might see this and, and see that somebody made a commit. It has a commit message, commit message up there, and then who uh, who participated in it, and that'll sit up there for um, for like 40 seconds or so, and then it'll just build its way down into the grid. And, and it's really I don't know I really like this one. I can kind of identify with it as a as a developer, but it's a fairly general idea that would kind of uh, apply anywhere really. Uh, we'll, we'll wait here and watch it fall. If it does, it was it was supposed to it was supposed to animated fall. Uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the Pi doesn't handle. Um, it's a little tough with animation. Like, I couldn't quite get it to do all these like smooth drops and stuff like that. So I, I just do like a little pulse and then a pulse. All right, cool. So. And turn that off. All right, so like those are, I guess that's a little bit of a um, little bit of the code, uh, and, and some of the some of the examples of the ones that I built, and so I'd like to think that you know if you look at those examples, they were all fairly simple, really. Like you were just concerning yourself with getting getting data from the API and representing it, right? I'd like to think that I've done uh, enough of the like uh, dirty work around the actual communication and architecture. To where you know if you wanted to build one of these for yourself, uh, it's just a matter of figuring out what data you want to get, uh, where to get it from, and then aggregating it, and then just determining how you want to display it. Uh, a couple of other things that, that you get from the actual the actual project uh, is this really cool control panel. Uh, and so this is um, you, you've kind of seen me messing with it up here a little bit. Uh, this is the control panel, so it shows you all the all the nuggets that are connected. We've actually got three of these in our office. And it's been really been useful because uh, they're they're kind of separated out. I don't want to have to have a keyboard and mouse hooked up to every single one of them. So this gives you the ability to to go in and uh, switch data sources. Uh, you know, you, see me, you saw me just like bouncing around between data sources up here. So it's it's a really good convenience uh, for, for performing maintenance uh, and, and troubleshooting uh, anything that might go wrong with these little clients. Uh, I've also done a couple little. Cool things where I can add custom text and put it up there on the board and stuff. Uh, super convenient. Uh, so all that, um, I guess that, that was that was that was most of how, how the software works. But since this since Raspberry Pis are in the title of this presentation, I'd be remiss to not actually talk about the hardware component of this a little bit, which is a really intriguing, uh, like, just idea w with what's going on here. I could spend an entire talk. Uh, on the hardware and the nuances of everything uh, going on. I'll, I'll keep it fairly high level. Uh, but it, if you have any questions afterward, uh, come up and talk to me about it. I'll, you, can, you can mess around with it. 
there's just a ton going on there, uh, and, and it's really, I don't know, it's interesting stuff. So what you're seeing up here, uh, there are actually two main components, uh, and then, then some supplementary components. There's a, uh, a projector, right? Uh, you're seeing it right there. And in this case, uh, I actually went with this Acer X1220H. Uh, it's, it's a really good projector. It's, actually, it's got 2,700 lumens. And, and for a price of $380 uh, at, that, uh, at that lumen level, like, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, it, it's a really great price. Uh, the only drawback is that it's got an incandescent bulb instead of uh, one of these newfangled LED bulbs. So you're not going to get as much life out of it, but you're spending maybe a fifth of the price as you would for the equivalent lumen, uh, lumen amount on an LED projector. And the other, uh, the other part of this uh, equation is the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi, uh, I've got one right here if you want to see it afterward. Uh, very small. This is a full-blown computer. It's got an ARM processor. Uh, it's a 700 megahertz processor with uh, graphics built into the chip. Uh, it's got HDMI out, Ethernet out, a couple of USB ports. Uh, and it's only 35 bucks. And like, even if you don't know what you want to do with it, like it's worth buying just for the sake of experimenting. Uh, and they also have a cheaper model that's 25 that only has, uh, it doesn't have Ethernet and it's got uh, one less H, uh, USB port and stuff like that. And then alongside of that, you know, it, it needed a few more compo components. Uh, so I needed a wireless adapter uh, and a projector mount. And then at the bottom here, I needed a, I bought a wall charger and a, a powered USB hub. And the, re the reasoning behind this, you know, I probably could have gotten away without these. But the Pi is actually fairly sensitive to power. And so if you start cramming on you know, a wireless adapter or a wireless keyboard onto the Pi, it only, it only pulls 5 volts. And so it can't really handle um, a whole lot of really power-heavy components plugged into it. So the powered USB hub uh, is kind of an attempt to mitigate that. By powered, I mean that it's actually plugged into the wall and drawing power from the wall instead of drawing it over the USB cable from the device itself. So it kind of leaves the device to its own power necessities. Uh, and then I bought a wall, a wall charger. Uh, the Pi actually just connects with a, uh, a micro USB um, connector, so any phone charger would really work. But the, the wall warts that you see for phone chargers, usually they'll run about 700 milliamps to an amp, and I just kind of wanted some insurance there. Uh, but I, I guess the, t the takeaway from this is that like, it's, it's not you know, all fun, happy land with the Pi. Like, there are some little like weird things about it that you should be aware of, uh, and power is one of those. And then, so if you put all those together, uh, and I threw an SD card in there, the Pi, uh, the installation uh, runs off of an SD card. Like it's about 500 bucks, and I think for like the coolness factor uh, that these provide, uh, I think that's a price point that like I could get behind, and that you could really probably convince like a company to to expense out, or at least expense out of a, a portion of that, you know, for the awesome factor that. That, that it really brings to, to the office. Um, so I, I guess, you know, it's really not all that expensive. Uh, I mean, $500 isn't super cheap, but, you know, you, you could spend way more uh, on an equivalent thing. And so having put that together the first time uh, and kind of refined it a little bit, I went to, I went to build a couple more of these, these nuggets, and, you know, more problems beca be became to, became to uh, it became more uh, apparent, right? If I'm going to have these in remote locations, you know, the way that I was working this one is I'd walk in the front door, I'd walk to my desk, I'd grab the remote, and I'd turn it on and off. Uh, and if I've got these in different buildings and stuff, I really don't want to have to do that. So I needed a way to power it on and off automatically. Uh, and, and projector power was the main concern there, right? Because uh, you gotta you got to be a little bit sensitive about how you, how you treat projectors. When you turn them off, you can't just rapid fire it. The bulb doesn't like uh, being turned on and off uh, a whole lot. So... Uh, it was a problem that, um, that, I, that I, was, I was working on solving. And so one thing that the Pi does offer is, is this, this array of, of general purpose I.O. ports. Uh, and you can do a whole lot of things with these. And the, what, what eventually I ended up coming up with is I found a, a couple of things online. There was a guy named Alex Bain who had built a universal remote out of a Pi. And essentially... What he had done was, was what I wanted to do here, really. I, w I wanted to simulate uh, a remote and, and kind of run that through these, these GPIO ports. And GPIO. And so he had the circuit up here. And uh, up there is the, is the pinout for that, that GPIO port. And all this is is it's just a little IR transmitter uh, and receiver circuit. 
And so uh, this is this is a fairly it's a fairly simple circuit, right? You just need a couple of LEDs and a transistor uh, and some power, and you can build one of these, which only looks slightly like a bomb, uh, <laughs> but it it does the job, right? And, and so this worked, right? This is this is obviously a, a prototype, but the moment that this worked for the first time, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. It's actually going to work. The, the problem here is, you know, obviously this, right? I'm not going to have a duct tape proto, proto board <laughs> hanging from the ceiling uh, with, with components there. So I, I experimented with some molten lead and, and learned soldering, right? I'd never actually soldered anything before. Uh, and this was a really good opportunity to get into it. And with, with such a, a simple circuit like that, I, it's really not complex. So if you're interested in soldering, uh, this is a good example. But the parts for this are really... Uh, really cheap, right? Uh, it gave me an excuse to go out and buy more stuff. And these are, it's really not a whole lot of components. I bought a $10 soldering iron, which is probably cheaper than I should have gone with. But uh, the parts here, you know, you're really only looking at maybe 20 bucks worth of stuff. Uh, and these, these presses are probably even more expensive than you would find if you, uh, if you actually did price shop. I wasn't price shopping for them, but it's only, it's only a dozen different things, half a dozen different things there. And then it looks, it looks much nicer, right? Uh, a little proto board there with some, uh, some LEDs and stuff. And so what that ultimately allowed me to do was, was control the projector from here, right? So the, what happens is uh, on, the, on the Pi itself, uh, I've actually, you, you can use this, this, this thing called LRIC, which uh, Linux infrared remote control, infrared control, something like that. And uh, you basically calibrate uh, a configuration file uh, using that receiver end of the circuit. And then it writes out a config file, which gets put into Etsy. And you wire up a couple of, uh, you configure which GPIO ports on the Pi uh, it should send signals to. And then you just hook that little circuit up to the Pi. And you can invoke these LRC commands uh, like IR send key power. And so what I can do here is then I can actually Let's see if we can get this to work. So if I hit a button on here, it'll actually bring up. So that just simulated one remote click on there. And that's the projector actually doing that. That's not, uh, that's not the Pi. That's not a display out from the Pi. And so that's super convenient. And like again, being able to walk around and turn projectors on and off uh, with an iPad or, an I or, or a phone is a really powerful feeling. Uh, it, it, it makes you feel really good about it about what you've done, I guess. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like you to like, think about how you can like, make one of these for yourself. You know, what, what internal and external APIs do you have that you can get data from? What, uh, what are the things that impress your company or your visitors, right? Uh, is it current users? Is it, is it GitHub commits? You know, is it relevant to your product team? Uh, maybe it's shopping cart items purchased. Or, or videos watched. Maybe it's the number of app downloads, right? What is your, what's your biggest number? What's your most dynamic number? What's your company's most unique number? You know, and, and take that and, uh, and visualize it and then you know, just, just fork the repository and, and write the data source in the display uh, and, and see what it looks like, right? You don't even have to have the hardware to see, to see if, if it would work for you, right? You can just bring it up on a monitor, bring it up in a browser. But you know, if it is awesome, you know, throw it up on a wall, right? So I think that's, I think that's all I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions?